brother, man. It's an honor to have you on the show. Thank my you man. very much. My pleasure. Great to be Absolutely. here, man. So for those that don't know you first, give us a little background on where you're from. I'm from the DMV, Prince George County. Grew up in what was called a small town. They don't even, most people don't even know it's called Beaver Heights, Maryland. Mm. It's now all called Capitol Heights, 2743. And um, I went I went to school around there. I went to Beaver Heights Elementary School. Went to Mary McLeod Bethune Junior High, Fairmont Heights. I went to DeMatha briefly. They put me out, though. Why they put you out? I was clowning. <laughs> Class clown, cutting up. Pranking, practical jokes, pulling people chairs out when they would sit down, and it's like, man, what's that? You there, you get you get Saturday detention. That's the first thing. So I was in school six days a week. I was in Saturday detention. <laughs> then if you stop, you keep misbehaving, then they they have a one meeting. You meet with Father Aaron. That's who it was at that time. If you don't change after that, they you gone. Yeah. I remember I got home. They used to catch three buses to school. I got home. And Mr. Moylan, the principal at the school, was on the phone with my mother. And she said, well, tell him to try McNamara. I was like, I ain't going no McNamara. So I ended up back at Family Heights. But it was, I didn't, I wasn't fighting or anything. They just clown. It's like, you, you don't play, you ain't on the football team. You don't play varsity. You don't do nothing. You ain't bringing our, our image up. You just a clown for no reason. So, yeah. I wasn't doing anything different than some of the basketball players were doing, but. I think if I was on one of the teams, they'd have gave me yeah, some grace. Probably so. I was Team Joan. <laughs> so, so that's where I'm the, from. What's the difference between past the battle and key the battle? I, you know, I really can honestly say, as I think about that question, that it's not any difference. I really don't. Like, I really try to think, like, what am I? I that's who I am. Mm -hmm. Actually, Keith Battle is who I am. Past the Keith Battle is what I do. But it's not. Like, I don't I don't change when I do that. I'm still, I'm still, I, I'm still serious about what I do. I st I'm still gonna be a comedian. I still wanna have fun. I still like um like I take all of who I am into that. Like I don't become something different in that role. But I appreciate it. I think it helps me to live at a higher level, like, because I don't want to let the community down. That might be the only thing I think is their inherent pressure to live with integrity. Mm -hmm. But there's no, it's not two different people. Nice. Do you think yeah. that's why people gravitate to you? A lot of people say that it's so easy and they feel like they know you even though you're a pastor. Yeah, I think, I think people in general, particularly younger people, are looking for authenticity. Like, is the person real? And I think, you know, because y'all can really pick up on that. Like, fake. Like, y'all have a fake meter. So, if they see consistency, like, this dude is just like this all the time, I think that matters. And I think they're not used to it because I think there's this mindset when you become, you're in a ministry, you talk differently. Hey, God bless you. I tried that, by the way, because when I was when I was in church as a teenager, there were certain preachers that would come to my church and they would preach, and that's how they sound. But I was like impressed by it. So when I first tried to start preaching, that's what I did. I would go like, uh, uh, uh say amen, uh. and it was just so weird, man. And I remember the first time I snapped out of it. I was trying to do it at this church. They asked me to speak, and I was I went into that yeah, first uh, giving honor to God. No, pastor. And I wouldn't say Israel. i say Israel. <laughs> it was stupid, man. And I remember what happened. There was a lady sitting on the front row of this church. And she was staring at me like she was angry. Like, like I'm like, I'm just a kid. Why are you not happy? And it scared me. And I remember what I did. I went like this. I clapped my hands like, like because I was trying to snap out of it. Because I never, I wouldn't preach with notes. I would always just go up there. Freestyle. Not really freestyle. I would study a lot. So by the time I went up there, I knew what I was going to say, but I got I lost what I was trying to say because she scared me. Wow. And the way I did it, I did it like this, trying to snap out of it. And that if people watch me now when I'm hands free, I do this while I'm preaching, like but not because it's not a habit now. But when I did that, Family Heights came out. I was like, man, what I really want to tell y'all is, and for, I'm, it was like that was an epiphany for me. That's who you are. That's that's, and I was like, God called me like that. He didn't call me to be like, 
I'm not judging other preachers who talk like that. I'm just saying, he just said, you don't have to do that. Just do, just, just, I want you to do that. Do who you are. So what age did you start preaching? I was 19. I was 19 when I first did it. I was, they call that jack legging. I ain't had no, I wasn't official or nothing. I just was there preaching to people, like at work, mm -hmm. like trying to get people straight. But when I was 21, on my 21st birthday, the pastor of the church, the First Baptist Church in Highland Park, gave me what they call a trial sermon. Mm -hmm. Cause I had, by then they had seen I was serious about the Lord and stuff. And I went to some of the leaders and said, I think I'm supposed to do this. And so they gave me a trial sermon that night. And and when you, the trial sermon is you're supposed to preach in front of the leadership of the church, and then they decide if they feel like God called you. Do you remember your message? Oh, yeah. Was it was Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, called From Here to Eternity. Mm. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I remember that. And remember it, was, that. It, was, it was pretty special. I've never preached it again. It's like, that's like, that's like the Holy Grail. Like, that was my first one, you know. Like your first girlfriend or something. Maybe that's not Maybe that's not appropriate. But <laughs> yeah, I remember that. So you're from the community, right? So yeah. right now, we're seeing this transition where it's hard for our community to get back on track. Mm. A lot of our kids have been incarcerated. You know, we got a lot of issues, family, homes, generational curses. Mm. What do you think the goal is, or how do we get back on track as a community and as a family? Man, that's that's a good question. It's a great question. I, I think what we have to figure out is how to start from where we are. Cause I think a lot of old school people like like when you hear old school, they keep trying to go back to the way things were before it got really bad. And the way things were, one of the, one of the things that minimize violence, you would see cross community violence at some level, but we seen we seen people killing their boys now. And I think part of it is, Neil, what happens is when we were young, you play, you don't see this anymore. You went outside and played, right? And you went outside and played without adult supervision. Like you'd be out there until it got dark. Y'all playing whatever, touch, football, basketball, tag, talking. Like that was, it was understood when you went outside. You just say, mom, I'm going outside. Or if you weren't on punishment, you went outside. Well, that's not happening anywhere now. Nobody goes outside unless they go into practice. And it's always structured. And now relationships are done virtually. So people connect through social media, through technology. They even have video games where you can like play with people in different parts of the world. Let's go on, let's get online and play games. So that virtual thing has made us more suspicious of each other as opposed to, man, this is my man, we shoot ball every day. He, he, we always end up checking each other or whatever. And, so how do we take this virtual world that people can can threaten each other from behind a screen and everything and start from there and then create a place of peace? I think that's the big challenge because we feel like we got to go back to that, but we can't we can't eliminate the technology. Our kids grow up on technology now. So I think um, understanding how we can create community on platforms that connects you with a world because you don't even know your neighbors but you're known on social media as somebody, and you know you don't even know that's you, right? Because you're famous as, uh, you know, Cray Dog or something like that. <laughs> like you, you, so I think, I, think, I think we have to create intentional times where we connect using technology. And I think parents have to create community events or community things where people are coming together more. But I think so many people are just trying to pay for their homes and they live in their own world and their own space. I really don't know how to fix that other than how do we, but I know this, we're going to have to start from where we are because mm -hmm. nobody's going out, ain't, ain't nobody sending their kids outside. Right. Like who out there? It's just, we, there's so much distrust. Mm -hmm. It's a hollow. A lot of the community centers are packed now. Like we had one and shoot. Mm -hmm. That's gone away. A lot of the outlets for kids to go have fun are being taken away as well. That's a great point. Yeah. That's a great point. And some of that is political. Right? Like some of our like if if we don't vote in primaries, if we only vote in primaries and we don't we don't we, we only vote in every four years, I should say. And we don't vote every two years for senators and congressmen and people who make legislation mm -hmm. and who control the budget. So whoever's in a position of authority in the seat of political power, the key is the budget. So typically when there's a conservative Republican 
presence in Congress or in, in authority politically, they tend to do less programs that are geared towards inner city and deprived communities. Mm -hmm. Typically, when there's a democratic presence in those places, you see more of those programs being funded and reinvigorated. And I don't think people are paying attention to the change in where money goes, right? right? When, when, and, and those, and those things, those, those programs they use like all night, like midnight basketball in Glen Arden, those programs have to be funded. Mm -hmm. So you have to staff it. You got to have, and it, you know, you got to have janitors there. You got to have security. You got to have personnel there. But when those funds are taken away, people aren't volunteering to do that because they need money. But something as simple as that, we're taking that off the program and we're going to put it over here. Mm -hmm. But they're putting it somewhere that's going to help people to have that they, you know, that they want to support, not the people that need those programs. Right. Right. And that money could go into prison mm -hmm. to prepare for people who we know are going to get locked up if they can't play basketball. Mm. Yeah. That's the message right there. That's a serious. That's, yeah. that's how it works. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to make, we're going to create a, a place for them to go where we can, you know, contain them and, and tame them. Absolutely. So you're big on marriage and family. Yeah, for sure. Why do you think there's a high divorce rate, especially in the black community? One of the reasons why I think a divorce rate is higher now than in the past, and I, I still don't want to make old school always better than new school, but it, Follow this thinking, right? There was a time where people's mindset was, I found the one. I found my soulmate. I found the one that my heart treasured. I found the love of my life, right? And when you found the love of your life or your soulmate, the next thing was, I want to spend the rest of my life with this person, right? We're going to have a family and spend the rest of my life with the person. That's that has slowly deteriorated down to this. I'm now marrying one of one of a love of my life, not the love. Right. This is one of the people that I've loved over the course of my life. So we decided because we got a baby and, you know, we kind of, you know, we like going into business together. We so we not we so we, we don't this person is not unique They're they're an option, right? So now I'm not trying to spend the rest of my life with you. I'm saying, let's give this a try. Right. So I'm coming in with a different mindset. And if I'm just giving it a try, then I'm not really interested in going through a lot of drama with you because the very nature of drama communicates that I made a mistake. When every relationship that endures, endures drama. But there's a mindset if we're going through drama, arguing, and we can't get along, then not, we just made a mistake. We're not fit for each other. And that's the immaturity of it. That's the difference of somebody said, I found the one I love. I'm going to spend the rest of my life. Thick and thin, better or worse, richer for poor. We in this. That was the, that, this a different mindset walking in. Because if I'm walking into something I'm just going to experiment with, then you ain't got but a few chances to mess up before I'm like, you know what, this, this ain't working. Man. You know what I'm saying? Why we... Why are we acting like this going to work? You know what I'm saying? By, mind you, the other options were never completely eliminated either. Like we kind of tend to maintain some level of, you know, she, you know we, we ain't nothing going on. We just friends. But that's also in the, wor in, in the world of poker, that's called an ace in the hole. <laughs> so we don't even have severing. There's no accountability to sever everything. So, you know, it's, that, I think it's a mindset part of it. And this, I wouldn't call, I wouldn't call this generation of black people soft, but I do think their tolerance for relational pain is a lot lower than it used to be. Right. And why do you think that is? I think it's how we come into it. Mm -hmm. Like, like I ain't going through what my mother went through. I ain't going through what my father went through, man. All these fish in the sea. I ain't, you know, I ain't, why are we, why are we going to be stressed out? Like, like, there's a there's there's a mindset that I'm committed to my happiness. I'm about being happy. Whereas before it was like I'm a co I'm committed to my family. Now there's this 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 attitude. I'm I'm I gotta be happy, man. I gotta you know, you know what I'm saying. I can't be in this. It take two, man. It take two. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, like this, this, so, so all it takes is one person that has that mindset that they know they're going to be happy before the thing deteriorates because the other person fighting for the relationship. I just think people are, people are getting married looser. Like with this, with this in their back of their mind. They may not say it because they say the same vows that everybody else says. They just know, you know, we're going, man, you know, I think, I think, I pass, I think, I think, I I think, I I think this, I think, I think, I think I'm going to do it, man. (laughs) Not, not so much. I know this the one, man. This the one I lay down my life for. Nah, this is Keisha, man. You know, Keisha a good woman, man. She a good cook. Yeah. You know, she, you know, she good. She good in bed or whatever, right? You know, but Cassandra good. Cassandra, Cassandra. <laughs> you know, Cassandra just, Cassandra just, just don't like traveling. Right. You know, it's, it's still this, it's a, it's a trial. Mm-hmm. I think more than a real, I'm in this for life. And I don't know when that changed. I just see it. And I think the tolerance for relational pain is a lot lower than it once was. Because you think, if you think back to generations of grandparents and the stuff they endured, like they may have, they, they didn't leave their house. Now he may have been sleeping in another room or on the couch, but he he was in there. Like, you know, and they just, that was what they understood. We, we, we staying, you know. And if you unpacked it, they had the same problems that we just ain't tolerating now. I ain't got time for that, man. I'm trying to do my, I'm trying to start my business. I'm trying to fulfill my purpose. I'm trying to blah, 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 blah. And people saw their purpose as family. I don't think it's as, it's as important now to everyone. So when you're leisure, what do you like to do? What do you watch on yeah. TV? Who killed ghosts? You know, I don't watch TV. So the only thing, and I don't watch television shows. I'll watch like like if the Wizards are on, they're playing an away game. I'll watch that. I love boxing. I'll watch a boxing match. That's it. I don't watch baseball. I barely watch football. The home team here is a is it makes you sick. So it's tough. So I mean, I I I just I just. I just feel like I don't want to sit in front of the TV when I can be doing something else. Yeah. But I'll watch something that I got a vested interest in, like our home basketball team or something. Like, I just don't watch a lot of TV. But what I do enjoy, I enjoy playing cards. Mm. I enjoy, I'm very competitive. So it's like, since I can't shoot basketball anymore without hurting myself, like I found ways to sit down and compete with people. Like I love winning. So I like playing pinochle. I like bed whist. I like spades, but I like spades one on one. Or what they call cutthroat. Mm-hmm. I don't like having a partner. Why not? Because I don't want nobody to mess me up. Well, if I'm going to lose. Two, you just told me it take two. To, to be married. <laughs> not to win in cards. I'd rather play you one-on-one in tunk. Gotcha. Or I, I don't, I, I'm competitive and I don't want my partner to mess me up. Gotcha. I hate losing. You got a deck in here? We'll play after this interview. Okay. For sure. Gotcha. Yeah. So what you think about Kanye West and this new religious movement? Kanye West is a, is a very complicated human being. Let's start there. By the way, I work with Kanye's father. We were on staff at the same church together. His right. name is Ray. He's a counselor. And I didn't know who Kanye was. He was just a kid when he would have him around. But um, his dad is eccentric. So Kanye is highly eccentric. And his losing his mother tilted him. And, you know, there seems to be a pattern of being married to a Kardashian that throws you off too. I mean, you got they didn't turn men into women. They, they, <laughs> they, they have a strong tendency of. But, but that being said, you know his political views are contrarian. He says some really strange stuff. But what he's doing now, and what appears to me is happened to him, is that he seems to have had though recent a genuine conversion experience where he no longer thinks he's God, but he's honoring God. Like something radical has happened in a deep place in his life that is, and and the way he's reaching people, that those of us who would even be considered less than traditional, Mm -hmm. like he's certainly reaching people I could never reach. He's got an incredible platform and he hasn't, he has been consistent with the Jesus message. So I think that's a good thing. I think that's a cool thing. 
And I think the way he does his music, if you listen to him, he's actually taking old songs and making them contemporary and cool. And it's really phenomenal. His talent is exceptional. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, I pray for him that he'll be consistent and that he'll continue to grow in his relationship with God. Um, and that, you know, he's going to be controversial because he's eccentric and some of his, and, and, and the thing is, is who's mentoring him is going to continue to influence even some of his political views. That's the thing. Because he, he, he may be a little distrusting of people who have attacked him. And I think the mistake that, that some of us in ministry are making is we're attacking him. And I think what it's doing is instead of some of the people who have access to him, who could talk to him, are, hidden, are, are, like, are like attacking him. And what happens when a person is attacked, either they fight back or they hide or they just, and what he, he needs, he needs support more than he needs to recoil into another hole where he's directing himself. That I don't think that's good. So if he came to you and said, pass the battle, I would like to do a concert for Zion. Would you allow him to do that? Absolutely. And here's why. I talked to one of the pastors who hosted him. And I just say, I said, you know, you don't have to tell me this, but what did it cost? And he said, it didn't cost me a penny. It was free. Because I pay, I'll pay, I'll pay Tank to come to my church on Mother's Day. Just to take, I said, he's going to take his shirt off just to get people to come. So they come to hear Tank, but I want to, I'm trying to, see, I, I like getting people that don't come to church to hear the word, right? right? That's what I'm trying to do. Not only does Kanye not charge people for the concert, Kanye flies all 150 people in his, car, in his choir on his own plane. He puts them up in the hotel and he feeds them. And he makes a donation to the church. He's coming not only his own dime, but he's leaving resources with the church. And I wouldn't even ask him to give us anything. But absolutely. Yeah. Because particularly if I get to speak, because he's going to bring an audience in, you know, because I don't know what Kanye going to say, because he might get in one of his raps and he takes somebody off and his doctrine might be a little tricky. But if I could, if I could piggyback on his platform and say, now nah, I just want to give you all a little message. Absolutely. Mm. Without hesitation. Oh, Without hesitation. Yeah. Kanye, if you're listening, yeah. Come on through. Shout out to Kanye. Absolutely.